Charlotte Thompson Iserby served as the head of policy at the Department of Education during the first administration of Ronald Reagan. While working there, she discovered a long-term strategic plan by the Tax-Free Foundations to transform America from a nation of rugged individualists and problem solvers to a country of servile, brainwashed minions who simply regurgitate whatever they're told. We now present to you the secret history of Western education, the scientific destruction of minds. The minutes reveal that in 1910, the Carnegie trustees asked themselves this question, colon, quote, is there any way known to man more effective than war? to so alter the life of an entire people. For a year, the trustees sought an effective, peaceful method to alter the life of an entire people. But ultimately, they concluded that war was the most effective way to change people. Oh, my God. World War I. Horrible. Oh, I mean, it made every other war look like nothing. They sent a confidential message to President Wilson insisting that the war not be ended too quickly. After the war, the Carnegie Endowment trustees reasoned that if they could get control, here we go, of education in the United States, they would be able to prevent a return to the way of life as it had been prior to the war. And they recruited the Rockefeller Foundation to assist in such a monumental task. Education should aim at destroying free will so that pupils are thus schooled. They will be incapable throughout the rest of their lives of thinking or acting otherwise than as their schoolmasters would have wished. Influences of the home are obstructive. And in order to condition students, verses set to music and repeatedly intoned are very effective. It is for a future scientist to make these maxims precise and discover exactly how much it costs per head to make children believe that snow is black. When the technique has been perfected, every government that has been in charge of education for more than one generation will be able to control its subjects securely without the need of armies or policemen." End quote. Young people cannot be trusted to form their own opinion. It's our job to tell them. I had never intended to become involved in the, the battle that all of us were involved in. Uh, I had no idea anything was wrong uh, with the way the country was going when I, uh, as I was growing up, uh, and uh, even uh, during my foreign service experience, uh, I found myself mysteriously, I would say the good Lord works in wondrous ways, being put in spots around the world or in my country where extraordinary things were taking place under the guise of change. And we've all heard that so much, you know, from the Obama administration, Bill Clinton, he was the first one to mention change agents, etc. So for some reason I, I was plucked out and uh, I found myself being sort of pushed. My name is Charlotte uh, Thompson, Isserby. my maiden name is Thompson. Uh, my husband, who I want to give great credit to at this point, uh, was Belgian from the Flemish part of Belgium. I met him, I'll explain that later, in Europe when I was working at the embassy in Brussels. Without my husband's uh, help throughout the last 30 years, certainly when we came back to Maine, uh, my work never would have happened. And uh, he understood beautifully. He had been highly educated in Europe and he understood the whole plan. In fact, about 
five years after we had come back to the United States, uh, someone gave me Gary Allen's book, None Dare Call a Conspiracy. I was on the school board, and uh, this lady called me, and she loved the work I was doing on the school board. Of course, nobody else did, but she said, I've got a book for you. And she brought it down, and I read it, and I looked at it, and I thought, I never heard of such a thing as this. I mean, this is a conspiracy to really take over the world. Thank you, Gary Allen, who's no longer with us. And so I said to my husband, good Belgian, well-educated, uh, do you know about this? <laughs> and so he took a look at it. He said, yeah, sure, I know about it. I said, you know about this? You know about the Illuminati and the Bavarian conspiracy? You know about all, all this, the plan to implement a world order? And, 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 uh, you, huh? and he said, well, yeah, I learned all that in school. And I thought, oh. Okay, so thank you, Jan, wherever you are. I think that maybe you're very involved in helping all of us right now straighten out this mess. We go back. I was born in 1930. Yes, I'm getting there. Hmm? My mother was from uh, Virginia, a wonderful Southern conservative, wonderful gal. And my father uh, came from Pennsylvania. He came from a family that uh, in, in mining. And his father was a very recognized uh, mining engineer. Uh, who ultimately went out to South Africa and uh, opened the gold mines. And my, and my grandfather knew all these people. My grandfather was Skull and Bones. My father uh, was uh, a wonderful person. He was mayor of several towns on Long Island, New York, and in New Jersey, and he was a real constitutionalist. And somehow he was still, he was a member of Skull and Bones, but he didn't have anything to, to do with the the power structure there, right? He, he absolutely nothing. Although he did go to their meetings and he went out to the island for retreats and more of that that stuff. He went to Bohemian Grove once, and uh, so I grew up in sort of an atmosphere of uh, it was a political in a way, except for local local politics, which my father was fabulous on. Anytime anybody did anything like wanted to break down local government or get rid of elected officials like regionalism does, my father would be right there with the constitution. So well, anyway, I went to private schools, and uh, I got out of uh, uh, prep school in, in uh, Wellesley, and I decided I really didn't want to go to college. A lot of people thought it was a mistake. I wanted to go to business school instead. I was tired of what I was, somehow I had a bad feeling about things that were being pushed in the prep school, like I, I was a member of World Federalists. I was falling for this junk, so, but somehow I didn't want to continue that. So. Instead of going on to Smith or Vassar or what, I went to Catherine Gibbs uh, Business School in New York City. Wonderful, wonderful, difficult, difficult school. But I learned best, best grammar, how to write, accounting, shorthand, which came in very, very handy, I can assure you, especially when I was in the Department of Education. I got out, I graduated, and uh, the Korean War was on. So. I, I was very patriotic. My mother had always worked for the Red Cross. She was a volunteer during World War II at the mental hospitals, bringing the guys in from the war. So I, I heard a lot about the Red Cross, which is, I want to point out right now, changed enormously from that time. And uh, I wish I could say in a better way. I think it does very good work. But it's connected with all the other, you know, uh, non-governmental, uh, non-profit groups, and they have all been infiltrated. I signed up for Korea, that's right, but they changed my orders. And at the last minute, I went to Guam. I spent a, a year there. My next assignment was Shitosi Hokkaido, another air base, fighter base, I think. I finished my tour. I didn't want to come home uh, by air. I wanted to uh, go by ship. So I decided to go. A friend of mine went with me, third class, in the bowels of uh, the Vietnam, which was a uh, freighter. Luckily, I was in third class, so I was down, and we had very good food, because French have good food, whether it's third class or not. Always a big bottle of wine in the middle of the table, and I, the people at the table were uh, coming out of North Vietnam, coming out of North Korea, and China. They were refugees, and of course, the Vietnamese ones spoke French, and the Chinese were very well-educated. They were well-educated well Chinese, so they spoke English. I spoke French. So the conversations were unbelievable. They would tell me what had happened, why they were coming out, what was going on under the communists, which uh, we didn't let General MacArthur 
you know, move in and, and take over. We, 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 Truman brought him home. We could have won that war. We could have kept the whole Far East from collapsing, but that wasn't the plan. That old soldiers never die. They just fade away. This one woman was taking her daughter to Paris, to the conservatory there of music, uh, to study piano. And she told me that her father or grandfather, I'm not sure, was a very famous pianist in China during the Cultural Revolution and that they cut his hands off. And so that, I never forgot that. And then the other lady, uh, she was from Vietnam, North Vietnam, and she told me that her grandfather, they, they uh, killed him because he was opposed to the communist regime and they cut his head off and they stuck it on a pole and they marched around town with his head on the pole, which of course was to, you know, warn the rest of the Vietnamese, keep your mouth shut. Don't go up against this regime. Then uh, my father, uh, <laughs> he's a New York lawyer, he's an absolutely wonderful person, great sense of humor, and I know he's skull and bone, so we have to forgive him for that. But anyway, so he says to me after, I've been gone for two years, mind you. This is his young daughter that he cried when I left, right? What are you doing going abroad? So after two months home, he said to me, Char, well, um, when are you thinking about moving on? And I thought, God, I've only been home two months. You know, I've been gone for over two years and they want me out of here. And I thought, well, you know, I guess he's right. You know, I better not hang around home forever. And so I went down to the State Department. I had all the background because of Catherine Gibbs. That's the best thing that ever happened. I had the credentials to get into the State Department to work for ambassadors, which I did assistant secretaries. I worked in Washington in Soviet affairs, in Middle Eastern affairs when all the Suez Canal stuff and everything was going on. I took dictation from John Foster Dulles. I'll never forget once when he was... Uh, this was really during the tremendous problems in, with the Suez Canal and everything, and they had uh, Golda Meir and the ambassador from Israel, you know, to the United States there. This is so funny because uh, I was taking shorthand, and so all of a sudden someone kicks me under the table. Golda Meir, uh, kicking, she's kicking her, her friend, the ambassador of the United States, whose name I can't recall right now, and, and uh, kicked me instead. And uh, I said, oh, gee. And she said, oh, I'm so sorry. She said, uh, uh, he's, he's dictating too, too fast. She's a, he's a very good friend of her. He's dictating too fast. There's no way you can get it. So anyway, those are little funny stories about the State Department. But anyway, and then I was in Soviet affairs. I saw very strange things there. I went to South Africa. I worked on, for the ambassador in South Africa. Fascinating because my father and my grandfather actually had lived in South Africa. Then I got sick and I came back to the States and then they assigned me to work for uh, Ambassador Douglas MacArthur Jr. That's the nephew of the general and in Brussels. He was a wonderful man. He was not easy to work for, but he was a wonderful person, good American. And that was at the time, again, you see where, where these things kept happening in my life. This was uh, the Belgian Congo crisis and in Katanga. And I was there, I saw all the cables coming in regarding the UN troops and how they were raping uh, citizens and nuns and people were dying and all. So I was there in Brussels, here I'm learning, Charlotte's learning, that the UN isn't what people think it is. And uh, I, all these cables coming in, I meet my husband. I meet him on a train going skiing. That's how I met my husband. My husband and I are engaged. We're, we we subsequently get married in the United States. He comes over. Then we go back to Belgium and we're there for about four years. And then from there we go again to a hot spot, which I didn't realize. I'm talking about the weird things that happened. Uh, the hot spot was Grenada. I could see then from our house overlooking the bay, you know, the lagoon in St. George's, all this activity. Uh, boats coming in with strange flags. Stokely Carmichael came down there to sort of stir up the pot to get the Grenadians, uh, you know, mad at the, cap the rich, nasty capitalists who own these yachts and all. It was really getting bad there. And I knew the political situation well because we had Grenadians working on the boat. I had a lot of Grenadian friends in government as well. Anyway, we left. Uh, we, were at, we were there about five years. 
And then when we left, I remember telling our Grenadian friends, you're going to have trouble here. This trouble's coming. And of course it did in 1984, I guess. That was one good thing Ronald Reagan.